to record alpha yeah, yeah i just started recording yeah right uh good evening everybody but uh, for some people good morning uh we have today dr professor pritam singh to speak on farmer struggle in india and hindu nationalism central decentralization these are the kind of areas that he is going to cover professor singh has a dpil dphil from university of oxford and now he is emeritus professor oxford brooks business school uh he also teach at uh, university of oxford lomonos of moscow state university jawaharlal nehru university delhi and the university of uberlandia in brazil he wrote a book published a book called federalism nationalism and development india and the punjab economy uh and he writes to economic and political weekly very often uh referring to his book on federalism nationalism and development late professor ajit singh of cambridge university described that work as one of those rare academic publications that have potential to change history professor singh was awarded the distinguished achievement award in political economy of the 21st century by the world association of political economy at its 10th world forum in johannesburg in june 2015 so with that short and brief introduction of professor singh uh, and without further ado i invite professor singh to make his presentation uh on a uh, farmers struggle in india which is ongoing struggle and how it relates with hindu nationalism centralization effort and also neoliberalism sort of thing uh thank you again pritham for accepting our invitation and to spend this evening with us probably it's morning for you yet uh okay without further ado i invite you to make your presentation 45 to 1 hour you can take okay okay thank you suman siri um, uh, it's it's real pleasure to be able to talk to the mark school which you're running which is a great thing and and uh, as you told me that you've been also discussing marx's capital and along with that more topical uh, issues so what i'm going to talk today as i title that um, indian farmers confront agro business capitalism centralization and hindu nationalism what i'm planning to do is to highlight or or you know emphasize more six aspects one i would uh, comment upon the three farming laws Uh, though in india there is a considerable knowledge now on these farm laws but maybe not in 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 sri lanka as yet so i'll i'll, I'll briefly explain those three uh, farm laws and the implication of these three farm laws to on on um, the development of uh, agro business capitalism of a specific kind and also that how it is leading to increasing centralization and how it fits into the hindu nationalism agenda of the modi government and how these three aspects of uh, development of agro business uh, capitalism dominated by a select group of industrial houses and centralization and hindu nationalism are interlocked and interrelated with each other i would then um, reflect on um, the <clears throat> environmental implications because that's an area which is not really very well talked about and it's kind of normally neglected uh, in in discussions on 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 the implication of these farms and also in the farmers uh, movement and and uh, through that i will also at the end reflect on the development paradigm 
which is behind the three farm laws and how one needs to counterpose alternative development paradigms, which at the moment, I think the farmers movement is not taking, but uh, how its success could, uh, if it's able to succeed in, in getting the government to repeal these farm laws, uh, has a challenge that it must articulate an alternative development uh, paradigm. So that's that's kind of um, you know six things I think I I will comment upon. But I'll be happy to answer questions, more specific ones, in the question answer session. So these three farm laws were brought as ordinances first in June, and that itself is important. That um, when these ordinances were brought. They were mainly called as agricultural marketing reform, which they are in one sense, uh, because they deal with marketing of uh, agriculture products and, and, and trading of them and storage of them and, and, and uh, the, the, the various legal uh, uh, structures associated with that uh, uh, marketing and, and storage. Uh, the, um, it was a period of obviously COVID emergency, which is a global health emergency, but similarly in India and developing countries, in fact, it's even more acute. And there was no crisis of any kind in Indian agriculture. There, was, there were no food shortages uh, of terrible kind. There were no massive rise in food prices. There was obviously no famine. There was no breakdown of the agricultural marketing system. So the question arises, why did the Modi government choose this period of COVID emergency, health emergency, to push these reforms? The explanation is simply this, and it's not very complicated, that most governments do utilize periods of crisis. Crisis could be a political crisis, it could be an environmental crisis, it could be ecological crisis, it could be uh, economic crisis, to push reforms which they think otherwise will attract attention and popular discontentment. Uh, Naomi Klein, a very well-known uh, author and journalist from Canada, had written a book called Shock Doctrine, where she actually elaborates this point, that how disaster capitalism looks upon disaster as an opportunity to push certain reforms of various kinds. It's called reform, but it basically means that you know, restructuring the economy, whether national or global economy, to the dictates of capital. So Modi government did this, and, and there are previous instances of similar kind of things being done. For example, there was a balance of payment crisis in India in 1991, and Narasimha Rao government had just come into power. They quickly brought in Manmohan Singh uh, as the finance minister and pushed the neoliberal economic reforms. No discussions, no dis you know, kind of a consultation with the states, no national level body like planning commission or you know, intergovernmental uh, uh, bodies which deal with this, they were allowed and no parliamentary discussions have been just introduced. And, 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 and similarly, instances have happened in Turkey, in Pakistan, and many developing countries. And in fact, IMF and World Bank have a strategy that you should look for an opportunity when there's a change of a government. And then, then that, that's a period, there's a very fluid period, it's a period of instability, and, and it's much easier to push, push these reforms. So that happened in 1991. So what the Modi government was doing now in, in um, 2020 was utilizing the COVID emergency to push these reforms, knowing very well that there will be opposition, but they thought that the opposition will be neutered, isolated, because the COVID people will not be able to get together, and they'll be able to manage that kind of isolated opposition. They had never thought that the opposition will be so widespread as it has become. And even those who opposed obviously did not think that the, the opposition will grow so, so, so massively. So um, um, one was this using the COVID emergency, but this was also uh, using the COVID emergency to put the agenda of big agro-business capitalist houses in India, who are also linked with international agro-business corporations. Um, to push their agenda on agriculture, because uh, some of the leading agro-business uh, corporate houses, selected industrial houses, two names come quite often and very rightly so, Adani, who are specializing in stockpiling of uh, food grains, and Abani, who are specializing in retail of uh, 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 food products, especially fresh vegetables and, and, and uh, fruits. Um, 
um, th their names were being mentioned. They have been eyeing various sectors of the economy and they have established a massive degree of monopoly takeover on the oil industry, on telecommunications, mobile phones, extra, on the media, but agriculture has been by and large outside their framework, which does not mean that there was no capitalism in agriculture. Capitalism in agriculture has been developing in India since the colonial times in different degrees. And of course, accelerated during the Green Revolution, launch of the Green Revolution strategy in the 1960s. But this was a new kind of uh, uh, capitalism. That's why one of the articles, which was one of the earliest articles to appear on this issue, I called deepening of agro-business capitalism. It was a deepening of capitalism. Capitalism was already there. So they were eyeing agriculture for a long, long time. And this has been also a global trend, that global uh, houses have been actually you know, looking at agriculture as a new area of investment and a new area of profit making, which has been outside the framework because they have been mainly concentrated on industry and finance. But this is an area which, which, which they wanted to, which they have been eyeing at. So they thought, of eyeing, you know, uh, using this opportunity of COVID emergency to push these uh, uh, three farm uh, laws. And, and these two houses, which I mentioned the, uh, in Adani and Amani, are one of the biggest industrial houses in India uh, in terms of the assets, in terms of the stocks and shares, and the total wealth they control. And they are very close to the Modi regime. They have found the Modi regime in a, in a major way. And the Modi regime uses its political power to help them. So there is a kind of uh, uh, you know, mode of convenient uh, sharing of interests. They reinforce uh, each other. So that was the reason that COVID emergency was used. So what are these three reform laws? There are three laws. The, uh, I mean, instead of going into the actual names of these laws, one can say the first law deals with trading and the pricing of products. Trading of agricultural products and the pricing of agricultural products. The second deals with what can be called contract farming. The third is called Essential Commodities Amendment Act. There was already an Essential Commodities Act uh, back in 1955, but that has been amended during this period. And, and I'll come to this, what does this amendment mean? So looking at the first one, the, the, which I said deals with trading and, and pricing. This was mainly to open the market for farmers produce outside what is commonly known as mandis. Mandis are state regulated markets which do not operate all over India, but do operate in some of the key states where food grains, especially cereals like wheat and rice are uh, produced. So what these mandis are, the mandis have uh, two roles. Uh, one, that these mandis uh, are places where the farmers bring their produce and the government's uh, public procurement uh, arrangement, which is through the Food Corporation of India, assures them a guaranteed price, which is called minimum support price, and which is, which is uh, announced in advance. There is, there is, there is a, a formula according to which the minimum support price is uh, fixed by an organization called Agriculture Price and Cost Mission which takes into account all costs. And there is, there is a debate that does not uh, include all the costs, especially family labor. Uh, but that's a slightly a different issue we can, we can explore in the question answer if people are more interested in that. But at least the farmers know that if they produce a product, mainly uh, wheat and rice, but in some cases, cotton and sugar cane also. Though minimum support price is also announced for total number of 23 crops, but it's mainly in wheat and rice that it operates very systematically. The minimum support price is announced in advance. And also the government uh, has an undertaking, an assurance that all what is brought to the market will be bought by the, by, by the state to the Ford Corporation of India. Okay? And, and these uh, 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 state regulated, by state I mean the local province, uh, you know, it could be Punjab, Haryana, UP, Rajasthan, whatever. And, and uh, so, so the farmers have the assurance that the, mark, that the product will be bought at this price and the whole of product will be bought. So there is, there is and that is, that is to incentivize farmers to produce those uh, crops. The background to that is that India had a terrible food shortage 
after independence. And uh, there was almost a famine-like conditions for, because of drought in 1964-65. The Indian government was highly dependent on food imports from India under a program called PL 480, Public Law 480, where America uses to America used to export uh, wheat to India, and in return, not get paid in dollars, but paid in rupees. And, and those rupees used to be accumulated in the American embassy and a huge amount of money, which was very unusual because in foreign trade, you pay in, 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 in hard currency, but this was a special arrangement that you don't need to pay in dollars. So the Indian government says that we don't need to face the problem of foreign exchange to pay for the wheat. We can, we can pay in rupees and rupees can always be printed by the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, any, any central bank has that sole authority. So it, 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 it kind of uh, was an arrangement specifically uh, made for uh, India. And of course, the American embassy used that huge amount of money, um, you know, rupee accumulation for all kinds of political purposes to, you know, support right-wing think tanks, intellectuals, you know, you know pro-freedom, pro-market uh, institutions against the rise of left-wing ideas. And especially when the when the communist movement in India has been fairly strong till the mid 60s, and and this was also used for uh, ideological uh, purposes. But the drought of 1964-65 accentuated India's food shortage, and the Indian Prime Minister shortly after that, not at that time, Indira Gandhi was in charge, but before that, Lal Bahadur Shastri was there. He gave the slogan "Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan," which was a combination of this. Uh, that Jack Kassan mean that they wanted to emphasize this role that you know Kassan is at the center of this move to increase agricultural production. And, and uh, uh, the, the Indian government, especially Indira Gandhi, was humiliated by the American president that you, you, are, you are coming to us with a begging bowl. So the Indian state was in a terrible need to achieve food self-sufficiency. And I have discussed in great detail in my book, which uh, Suman Siri mentioned, federalism, nationalism, and development, that the Green Revolution agenda was an Indian nationalist agenda to achieve food self-sufficiency, to become a self-reliant nation, that you cannot be a self-reliant nation, you cannot truly be an independent nation if you are dependent upon food, because India had come out from the colonial rule. So that memory of nationalism against for, for the colonial rule was very strong in the political consciousness of the ruling elites. So they, they knew that uh, we have achieved this political independence from uh, direct uh, colonial rule, but we cannot truly be independent nation if we are dependent on food. So food has to be the center of the economic strategy. So the earlier strategy of dependent upon industry, which was the second five-year plan industrialization, was changed towards agriculture. And agriculture became the mainstay. And, and central to that was this that we'll follow the, the, the green revolution technology, which was a mixture of using high yielding varieties of seeds, which were being uh, produced in America by international seed corporations, using fertilizers and insecticides, uh, which again were massively being used in, in America by international fertilizers, uh, corporate houses and insecticides and irrigation. And, and different areas of India were chosen to practice this uh, green revolution strategy called green, you know, because of the food uh, and crops, but actually it has turned out to be the most ungreen in terms of the environmental havoc it has, has caused. So, so, um, so that was the internal push from Indian uh, state side that the Indian nationalist agenda, you know, that Indian nationhood demanded that you should have food self-reliance. So Indian nationalism, the ideology of Indian nationalism were used. Similarly, the Jai Jawan is also kind of uh, militarily being very strong, you know, that whether it's a conflict with Pakistan or, 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 or which was in 65 and 62, there was a conflict within China. So it was also harping back to the ideas of uh, uh, Indian nationalism, with the military strength of Indian uh, uh, nationalism. Uh, so coupled with this, the internal need of the Indian elites to, to become self-sufficient in food grains, which led to the Green Revolution strategy, was also the international changes which were taking place, the development of international agro-industry in America, uh, in, in seed production, 
in fertilizers, insecticides, new agricultural implements, tractors, harvester machines, and so on and so forth. So they all, those are two things combined together. The, the internal needs of the India ruling class and the needs of the big agro corporations to find markets for their products, both machinery and, and, and uh, non-machinery like uh, fertilizers and seeds, that stuff. So that's what uh, the Green Revolution strategy was. And central to Green Revolution strategy was this, that you assure to the farmers that your produce will be bought at an assured price, which is you know announced in advance, and it'll be the whole of it will be bought. And when the areas were chosen, area was chosen, keeping this in mind that they were wherever there are irrigation facilities and the peasantry, which is used to using the irrigation techniques. And it was used in selected districts in, in, in other states, for example, in Pardwan district in Bengal and Palagar district in Kerala, in East and West Godavari districts in Andhra Pradesh, Western uh, uh, UP, Meerut and the areas around that, Northern Haryana, Karnal and that, but the whole of Punjab. The reason behind the whole of Punjab being used was that Punjabi peasantry had long tradition of using irrigation techniques during the colonial period. Colonial regime had looked upon Punjab, a land of five rivers, so there was you know, very good river water sources to develop canal colonies in what is now the Western Punjab, which was linked up with the idea of increasing agriculture production and through agriculture production, raising revenue for the British state, which was then used to have uh, used to expand the British army and uh, imperialist uh, colonial expansion to the use of British army. And that was linked up with army recruitment, that the soldiers were recruited into the army. And after retirement, they were given plots of land uh, in this uh, canal colonies. And, and uh, so this was also an economic program of increasing agriculture production, increasing land revenue, and, and increasing the revenue sources of the state for militarization, and also in center for military recruitment. So a large number of people from Punjab and when I say Punjab, I mean okay. the Punjab, which included the Western Punjab, which is now in well, Pakistan, and Haryana, which is also was also a part of that. Large number of farmers, peasants were tooted into this, and they were the backbone of the British colonial uh, army. So when partition took place, a large number of these farmers, many of them Sikh farmers, you know, who had migrated from the Eastern Punjab districts where Sikhs are more concentrated to these, they migrated back. Uh, to, to, to East Punjab. And so these farmers knew irrigation techniques. So they, they looked upon Punjab as the most suitable place and flat land for irrigation network. So there are irrigation networks, peasantry which knows, knows these techniques, so they push forward. And the Punjabi elite was also very uh, accessible to accepting this more than any other elite, uh, partly because of their background in agricultural techniques. So this, this program fixed and, and initiated. And it was a success. It was a success because India got transformed from food import country to a food exporting country. First, food self-sufficient by early 70s, but eventually food exporting country. Now India exports rice, a massive amount of rice, and also wheat, though normally damaged wheat, which is not for good for human consumption, but normally used as cattle feed in many of the countries where big uh, cattle ranches are raised for, for slaughter and, and, and meat industry. So, so, so that was the uh, background to which, uh, um, you know, marginal uh, minimum sport price and the public procurement were used and these markets were uh, state regulated markets were uh, created. Now, this first uh, uh, law which was proposed was was aimed to create alternative markets where new traders can come in, where farmers can, uh, the option given was that the farmers can bring that product to these markets. And the incentive was that there will be no fee or cess charged on the trading of these products, which were earlier charged in the state protected markets. That revenue, that, that cess was not on, on the farmer, that was on the trader. And these traders were given this freedom that you will not be charged fees. And the, the argument was, the, the, the plan was that 
Therefore, these traders will be able to offer mark, the farmers slightly higher price than what is available in the regulated state markets because they don't have to pay the fees. And, 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 and say, for example, if in the state regulated market, the wheat is being sold at say 1800 uh, rupees per quintal, it might be, uh, so it might be sold in the uh, outside uh, uh, trading yards and 2000 rupees. So the plan was eventually the state regulated mandis will not be able to compete with these open mandis of traders and they will evaporate. And finally, the farmers will be subject to these big traders. And the farming community immediately understood this. It was almost like, like an instant reaction. They knew that this is the game plan, that we will be exposed to this, that we are not going to buy this argument that this is to increase the freedom and choice of the, of the farmers, which the government was trying to put forward. But this is to increase the trading uh, of, of big traders. And they knew big, who are the big traders. Big traders will be these uh, Adanis. And, and they're already, already they're operating, but in a limited way. And, and, and uh, according to one television program, Adani has 9,000 silos. Silos are big stores where food which is procured is stored and then it can be uh, used to transport anywhere in, in, in the country and maybe even export abroad. And, and uh, so farmers have already known about this. So that will be expanded. So the farmers immediately knew that this would be an exploitative arrangement and there was no assurance of a, of a minimum support price. It was called remunerator price without defining what that remunerator price would be. So farmers knew that uh, this will expose them to the exploitation by big corporations, agricultural corporations. Now, there was another clause that if there is, uh, if, if, the, if, the, if there is a conflict uh, 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 between the farmer and the trader, that will be resolved through the conflict resolution, dispute resolution mechanism, which actually comes in the second law, which is about contract farming. Contract farming is, that the trader will enter a contract with a farmer that you will produce this product or this quality grade and uh, we will buy at this price when the final product is produced, okay? And, and um, so it will be an individual contract with a, with a, with a you know, farmer with which the trader will uh, achieve. And that was again, uh, giving greater freedom to these uh, traders, you know, agricultural traders. And, uh, uh, and if, if after the contact farming contact has been reached, if the farmer finds that the price offered in the state regulated market is higher than the price which has been agreed in the contract farmer and he wants to break the contract, the trader will be able to take the farmer to the dispute resolution mechanism and the dispute resolution mechanism will be handled by the subdivisional magistrate uh, which is lower than the collector or the deputy commissioner, the different names are used as the district administrative uh, head. And it is beyond the civil courts. This case cannot go, on, go to the civil courts. So obviously farmers also knew that if, if they break the contract and, and they want to utilize better opportunities in the state regulatory market, they will not be able to do that because they'll be, they'll be dragged into the litigation process and there are no position to, to litigate against a powerful corporation which has huge uh, uh, lawyers, expensive lawyers to deal with this. So farmers found that they'll be in a vulnerable position. So they didn't buy, the, the, buy this argument that it's to increase their uh, uh, choice. So, so a farmer's protest started emerging. Now let me briefly mention the third uh, uh, law, which is Essential Commodities Amendment Act. Um, or, originally this Essential Commodities Act was brought in 1955 to stop hoarding of food grains by traders because traders used to hoard grain, especially in a period of scarcity. And that, that, is, that is the logic of hoarding and speculation. That when actually there is, there is a scarcity in the market, you hold so that the prices go up and then you sell it later on. So you, you make a mess of profits out of that. So limits were set up that you cannot hold more than a certain limit. So that the government had the had the right to raid those uh, stored uh, holders, and government used to do that, 
and and government did in many many places in the 60s they 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 raided the uh, door traders who were hoarding this and those limits have been listed in this essential commodity limit there will be no limit which means that adani or any other agro processing uh, uh, or agri trader can buy as much produce as they want and they can store as much as they want and this was partly to also please international holders like cargill is a very big uh, food trader uh, right now it is the second biggest trader in india after the government which procures food under food corporation of india now the 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 um, the, the farmers did not see immediately the danger of the third act which have come to later on that the farmers should actually be uh, you know harping on that but they were able to see that it will de- definitely affect the consumers because if there is if 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 a big trader is able to hold without any limit and there is no law against uh, uh, holding they will be able to create artificial scarcity in the market raise prices and then this sell the price at a higher price and this is happening in other countries this is happening in china even and and then it has happened in mexico and other countries there is a similar phenomena which has taken place so nothing new and 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 so farmers organization started raising uh, the protest so they were in the lim you know limelight they were in the 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 the, the one one can say the vanguards especially from punjab because punjab had farmers organization long experience right from the 60s and some even going back to the 50s kisan sabha mainly under the left wing influence but in the 60s and early 70s even non left farmers organizations also developed to protect the economic interests of the farmers and these farmers organization has been in the field for for decades they had long experience and and a very well developed farmers organization leadership which was attuned educated the rise in literacy has also meant that farmers organization leaders are very well acquainted with the law and and the economic phenomena so they took the lead and they were soon joined by the haryana farmers and and uh, their uh, farmers organization were there but that not that massively and they could immediately see where the, the what the in, you know the indian uh, the punjabi farmers were doing was also in their interest first the protests were mainly confined within the state that they they stopped uh, railway network and and boycott of traders and you know and so on and so forth but eventually they see that there's no point in protesting against the state so they march towards delhi and and uh, so since uh, november they ha- they have occupied key entry points to the uh, uh, delhi uh, from number of uh, points uh, they have come to be known called singhu border tikri border gazipur border gazipur is from the up side so eventually it spread to up and rajasthan and eventually it is getting spread all over india there have been massive mobilization of work farmers in maharashtra in karnataka west bengal odisha uh, it is uneven but it is message is spreading in the other places outside punjab the farmers are not so much affected by the evolution of uh, a minimum support price and the dismantling of the public procurement system but they are aware of the danger of their land being taken away because uh, they feel that when big corporations will come they will take away our land we will be distressed farmers we will be indebted eventually they are the only asset they have is land and that will be that they they will be able to uh, kind of overcome their debt by selling land and our land will be taken away and the indian agriculture or you know or or different states will be converted into large scale capitalist farming where right from the point of production to trade to transportation to processing will be a seamless process and it will be a corporate agriculture which will come into the and and american style now on in america that has happened it happened in other places it has happened in 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 in, in, in england long time back for example in america the average farm size is about 450 acres you know and bigger farms even go into 3000 acres 4000 acres so leave aside small and margin farmers even big farmers and big farmers number is very small i mean you know people talk about rich capitalist farmers the number is very small only 0.57% farmers are more than 25 acres of land and and majority of the farmers in india are small farmers 86% 86.21% to be precise are marginal and small farmers 
marginal farmers are those who own less than one hectare, which is 2.5 acres, and small farmers are those who own between one acre to one hectare to two hectares, and two hectare is equal to five acres. So, so 86% of the farmers own less than five acres of land. So farmers all over India are now realizing that, that their land will be uh, 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 taken away. So that is the main driving force behind the farmers' protests. But accompanied with that is also two other oppositions. One is the state governments, and the other are regional parties. The state governments were opposed because uh, in the Indian constitution, agriculture is a state subject. That Indian constitution divides different subjects under center, the union uh, uh, subjects, state subject, and concurrent subjects. And the agriculture is a state subject. And the center has been intruding into agriculture uh, uh, in, for a long time, as I mentioned about uh, Food Corporation of India, Fertilizer Corporation of India, Cotton Corporation of India, various central institutions through which center has been already uh, penetrating into uh, agriculture, which is a state subject. But this was a watershed moment that straight away uh, uh, the center was, and one of the uh, uh, one provision in the two acts was that the state governments will have to accept whatever the center demands. So that was a naked expression of the centralization process, which was involved. And other dimension was the loss of revenue to the state governments, because right now, the state governments earn revenue from the agriculture produce, which the farmers bring in the trading markets. They are traders, commissioned agents, called artias in, in, in Punjab and Haryana and, 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 and whole of Northern India, who are commissioned uh, commission uh, agents. They are legalized, they are licensed commission agents. So they are charged a certain amount of cess. And that cess is used by the Agricultural Marketing Board, which is a state government uh, organization, to carry on rural infrastructural activity like building roads and building sheds and, and so on and so forth for farmers to come in. So that was also an attack on state revenue. And, and the state governments were alarmed because already the Indian government has passed, passed what's called GST, you know, general sales tax, where the sales tax originally was a state revenue subject that was taken over and the states were uh, assured that we will compensate you for this loss. And later on, there have been problems in compensating. So states saw that as an attack on the federal rights of the states in agriculture and on the revenue resources of the states. So states were also opposed and mainly non-BJP states. And, and so that was the second opposition. The third was the regional political parties also started seeing that this is an agenda to bring Hindu unitist, homogeneous Hindu nationalism because various other things which were being done fitted into the Hindu nationalist agenda. Uh, one slogan behind this was that one agriculture, one India, one market. Before that, one India, one language, Hindi. Okay, One India, one flag. And one India, one constitutional framework. So Jammu Kashmir's special constitutional status was abolished. And there was not much opposition. Okay, And so the, the, the regional identities knew that it is also an attack on, on, on them because Hindu nationalism is based on the idea that there's an overarching Hindu identity which overrides different regional aspirations and identities. And, and Hindu nationalism fears the rise of regional identity. If regional identity like Bengali nationalism or Tamil nationalism or Malayali nationalism or Uriya nationalism or Bengali nationalism or Punjabi nationalism rise, then the idea of a one homogeneous Hindu identity is weakened, it's undermined. So there is a direct clash between one homogenizing, centralizing Hindu identity and multiple regional uh, identities. So they also started opposing, and some of the places the opposition was very sharp, like in West Bengal, where she tried started Mamta Banerjee uh, of the you know uh, who rules, who is the chief minister, started uh, you know harping back on Bengali identity, Bengali language, Bengali culture, and and so on and so forth. So these three forces were aligned with the, uh, uh, each other. And this protest has been going on. And the amazing thing by, behind this protest is that it has been able to draw upon other sectors of Indian society, civil society, which have been hammered by the BJP uh, rule states. Like, for example, Citizens uh, Act, which was passed, which was debarring Muslims from getting citizenship if they migrate from the surrounding countries. 
which are Muslim majority countries, which was aimed at depriving Muslims of citizenship. And the protest against that, which was also very massive protest, was crushed. The, 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 the dismantling of uh, the constitutional status of Jammu and Kashmir was crushed. The um, uh, radical students' opposition in JNU and other places they were crushed. And this was the first movement which posed such a challenge that government was forced to negotiate with them. Before that, they will not negotiate. They were forced to negotiate. They tried to create splits in this by calling Khalistani. Khalistani is a word used for a political tendency which wants to create a, a, a Sikh majority state in, in Punjab where the Sikhs are in a majority. And, and or calling them Maoists, uh, uh, urban Naxals, you know, which is a new term which is used by BJP poor people. Uh, so to whip up uh, Hindu national sentiments or even secular Indian national sentiments against these uh, uh, currents. But this did not succeed. And it was amazing that farmers from Rajasthan and uh, Haryana started saying, if you are calling our Punjabi brothers as Khalistani, we are also Khalistani. The government found that the whole effort is counterproductive. And, and Khalistani tag is no longer pejorative. It's no longer demeaning. It is, it is, it is uh, actually becoming counterproductive. People who are not Khalistani, they're also calling themselves Khalistani. Like it had earlier up, happened when they started criticizing urban Naxals. Many young people said, started saying that I'm an urban Naxal. So, so, but this was much more widespread. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a state of affairs at the moment that this movement has you know, created a new culture, especially at the protest sites. They have been able to generate their own food and they have been drawn, drawn upon their own cultural resources. For example, langar is a tradition coming from Sikh religion where food is cooked collectively without any distinction and free food is served to everyone who comes there. And, and uh, they have long hundreds of years of experience. So they brought that langar tradition. So they were able to cook food they had, you know, you know regularly. And if, an, if a movement is able to have continuous supply of food, then obviously they, they are not going to be starved to death. They can, they, they can bear other things. And because it was winter months, uh, people started supplying them you know, blankets and, and, and beds and, and uh, you know, whole, whole sort of other machines. And, and there was an international solidarity. International solidarity came from a large number of Punjabi diaspora, which are rural backgrounds, who also felt that their whole, whole existence is at threat. One word which was used, which is a Punjabi word called hond. Hond means existence. That is not simply a question of getting a certain price. It is an attack on our civilization. It's an attack on our way of life, that this will be taken away. Or we have generational uh, link with our land. Even people who don't live in the rural area, they live in urban areas, but they have links. They have memories of, of having spent their childhood in the, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So it looked like a cultural civilization clash, and that has led to support from the uh, 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 diaspora spread all over the world, but mainly in UK, Canada, America, Australia, New Zealand, but also in Malaysia, Thailand, and other places. The movement became a self-sustaining movement. So the government was not able to uh, 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 crush it. And at the end, the government has come to accept that there are flaws. Which is a which is a very interesting that there are flaws uh, that there it does not specify minimum support price. So the prime minister spoke in the Rajya Sabha a few days back saying that no minimum support price is there and it will be there in the future and and the state protected agriculture marketing yard will not be abolished and and we are willing to consider also civil courts being brought in conflict resolution and also offering to delay the implementation. They have offered 18 months. So they are offering that we are willing to have amendments, which, which undermines their previous argument that these, the, these laws are th for the good of the farmers. So they are admitting that they have laws, okay? But the farmers organization are unanimously agreed on this, that we don't agree to any amendments. We want total repeal because they do not trust the government that if they, if, if they, if they, if, if they agree to amendments and postponement by eight, 18 months, then what will they do after 18 months? And, and, and we may not be able to mobilize on the same scale. Over and above that, the farmers organization has aroused these expectations among their supporters that we want repeal. And the farmers leadership is also afraid that if they reach a compromise with the government on, on some, some point, 
their own sport base will lynch them you know so so and the and the opposition which has emerged which has spread all over the country and uh, a phenomenon of a large gathering of farmers in up in haryana in punjab it's going to take place now in rajasthan and maharashtra has led to absolutely new mobilization and and uh, so so uh, you know that that is a point at which uh, there is a kind of uh, stalemate and 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 uh, we can look at how the stalemate uh, uh, can end in different ways but the two points very quickly because i'm running short of time i think uh, uh, is that i want to deal with the environmental implications of this and the the development paradigm the environmental implications is this that these big corporations will use chemicalized agriculture industrialized agriculture and and they will not bother about the local environmental condition that's one secondly studies have shown that small farming actually emits less carbon emissions than large scale farming okay and therefore if one is looking at the global climate change and global climate change is a serious uh, problem two aspects of global climate change one global heating and other biodiversity loss both are massive they are interlinked with each other but also have some degree of autonomy global heating uh, uh, on the question of global heating one uh, fact which i need to bring to your notice is that according to the uno panel on 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 climate change intergovernmental panel on climate change if the global heating leads to rise in temperature of 1.5 degree centigrade uh, by 2030 higher than what was the pre industrial age which is below it before 1850 there will be irreversible changes in the global climate cyclones droughts tsunamis and 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 we may not be able to control and the and the and the, and the very the existence of planet earth will be at stake along with that is the biodiversity loss large number of species are dying leading to ecological imbalance which has its own problems including production of food because there is a you know chain of events which lead to the production of food and 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 it's not merely that certain bees have disappeared or certain tigers have disappeared it has direct implication for human uh, life also the biodiversity loss so so uh, uh, the 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 environmental implication are massive which at the moment the farmers organization are not aware of it people like me are trying to bring into that uh, debate trying to make them you know aware that even if they succeed even if the even their protest succeed then government uh, agrees to repeal the farm that doesn't mean that we just go back to the status quo we have to start imagining a new kind of agriculture and and a new kind of uh, uh, farming where small farming which is ecological in nature and which is economical nature has to be developed so we would need new kind of strategy reconfiguration of development strategy that's what i call the development paradigm and that will be the last point i will make the previous development paradigms whether they are capitalist uh, paradigm or so called socialist i will i will explain why i call so so called socialist are based on this idea that economic growth means moving from agriculture to industry to services which has happened in the developed capitalist countries where agriculture has almost vanished for example in england only 1 to 1.5 uh, percent uh, uh, is the contribution agriculture makes to gdp similarly in terms of employment only about 1 to 1.5 percent people are employed in agriculture uh, almost nearly 80 percent even industry is gone 80% people are employed in the service sector in banks and insurance companies and tourism and hotel and you know and all the kind of uh, uh, tertiary industries and that has been the model but part of that model has been that part of the industry and part of the agriculture has been you know pushed to the developing countries food is produced in the developing countries and imported from that and 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 so on and so forth so the idea was that this is what development means you know that you dismantle agriculture go into industry and then even build, you know beyond industry you depend upon services sector and the so called socialism mean that in soviet union the socialist revolution took place which ended the private property in land but they also follow the same model that that the model of development is industrialization so the the soviet union had a, a industrialization plan very ruthless industrialization plan especially under stalin which was not uh, there could have been alternative development strategy there was a debate 
very vigorous industrialization debate in, in Russia, which, which, which proposed different alternative strategies. For example, Bukharan had a different uh, development strategy, different from uh, what was being proposed by uh, um, Stalin. And even by Probojensky, who was close to Trotsky, um, uh, also had this idea of industrialization is the key. And their idea was that industrialization will create working class, and working class is the basis for uh, uh, protecting uh, socialism. A peasantry cannot protect socialism, and, and only working class can. And therefore, working class can only be born if there is industrialization. So their model was also based on what Stalin implemented in a most ruthless fashion in the 1930s, where even small and medium farmers were called kuleks. Kuleks was a word used that they are rich farmers. They are resistants. They are, they are property holders. They are right wing. They are reactionaries. And there was a large scale killing, liquidation of these farmers. And the terrible uh, uh, human loss of life which took place in Soviet Union, which is one of the most uh, tragic uh, period of, of, of uh, Soviet uh, uh, life. And that was also based on this. And the new paradigm, new development paradigm, which I would like to call eco-socialist paradigm, is a negation of both. It's a criticism of the old capitalist model of uh, uh, development, but also critical of the old socialist model of development. Now, the farmers' organization, many of them, even led by the left wing, are not fully aware of this. They, they in practice, support small farmers, but in theory, they still believe in industrialization. Though the idea of Maoism, that peasantry is a revolutionary class, changes a little bit, but even Maoism also does not say that you can protect small agriculture, that it's only peasantry used as a revolutionary class, but eventually you have to build industrialization. Okay? So the eco-socialist idea is, that we have to reconfigure the importance of agriculture and within agriculture, small peasantry, it's a new development paradigm which the rejection of the old paradigm of development, rejection of the old Stalinist, old socialist model of uh, development. And, and this is a transition program that eco-socialism will not come in one day, but we have to move towards that. Uh, ecologically informed agriculture, organic agriculture, which doesn't natural agriculture, which does not depend on fertilizers and insecticides, and, and, and which, is, which is dependent upon old, old practices of, and depending upon the old knowledge of the, of the farmers, and, and also new developments which are taking place in organic agriculture, including the organic fertilizers. So new techniques of farming have to develop, which does not damage the environment, because the ecological threat to humanity is, 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 is very, very serious. So we need to develop that. But that is a, is, a, is a course of action which one would be able to advocate and propagate only if the farmers' organization are able to win victory. So one could say that to move toward that eco-socialist framework, the necessary condition is that these, these laws are appealed. They are pushed back. Because if they, if they go ahead, that will lead to massive destruction of the peasantry and massive destruction of the environment. So that is a, that's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. Sufficient condition would be that once they are appealed, we launch a program of new uh, eco-socialist transition of agriculture, propagate that, you know, farmers' organization, organize debates, uh, you know, bring that idea into their consciousness and transform political and economic uh, uh, consciousness. So I will conclude by saying this, that this uh, farmers' protest has huge implications. Huge implications also because it's drawing attention of farmers in different parts of the world. Farmers in England have noted this. And leave aside the you know, diaspora. Farmers in, 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 in Latin America have noted this. The article which I wrote in Economic and Political Weekly, which was one of the earliest articles to come on this issue, has been translated in French. It has been translated in uh, Spanish. So it's obviously gone to Latin America, where apart from Brazil, most of Latin America uses Spanish as, as, as a language. It is likely to be translated in Portuguese and other, other languages. And, and, and so farmers are all over the world are looking upon this farmers' protest as the, the first possibly successful revolution and in, 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 in political revolution that at least they're able to challenge this government. Earlier, this government could not be challenged. So it has huge significance in, in going beyond the national boundaries of uh, uh, India. And, and uh, so uh, it is a challenge to Hindu nationalism. 
it is a challenge to centralization project of hindu nationalism it is a challenge to the agenda of agro business capitalism it is it is it is a program for uh, bringing agriculture back into uh, development agenda and eventually to re reconfigure what kind of agricultural development and what kind of uh, economic development what path of economic development we need to follow thank you i think i'll conclude here Uh, Professor Lienega, I think your mic is mute. Mute Kalatine. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation, which is lucid and detailed. Uh, but I'm not going to summarize it, and I will open the floor uh, for discussion, observations, and comments. Uh, yeah, who wants to? Ask the first question. Uh, yeah, I would. I would like to ask what question, uh, comrade sir. Hello. Yes, yeah. Ranjana. Yeah, we can yeah, hear. Um, uh, uh, thank you very much, Preetam Singh. Actually, it's very important speech uh, that I uh, had a chance to hear. Um, the finally, you explained that uh, this. Uh, struggle uh, would uh, affect for the uh, nationalist, Hindu nationalism. Is it kind of the way the, the fight going on to affect the Hindu nationalism or the, the way the, uh, the governments try to enforce the law and that might uh, eventually affect for the Hindu nationalism as a point of view uh, you try to explain us? Uh, how this project is linked with Hindu nationalism is uh, this that they want to create one integrated uh, Indian market. Uh, and that is also the logic of uh, big capital. That has been the logic of big, big capital even before, that the big capital, big monopoly capital in India does not want India to be divided into states the way they are. When the, when the idea of linguistic reorganization of states took place, FIKI, which is the which at that time was the biggest organization of capitalists in India, they opposed uh, this uh, re, you know, reorganization of states on linguistic identities, Bengal and, 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 and Tamil Nadu or Andhra Pradesh and so on and so forth, or, or Punjabi speaking state, because they wanted uh, you know, that there should be no barrier between states and, and there should be one single uniform market where you know, capital can go anywhere without any restriction, without any state laws impeding uh, those. And the big capital uh, wants that. And Hindu nationalism, Hindu nationalists are also opposed to uh, 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 these regional identities. Uh, for example, Hindu nationalists also did not want linguistic reorganization of states. They wanted geographical distribution. There's a South India, East India, West India, um, you know, North India, and so on and so forth. That it's purely an administrative arrangement. It's not based on linguistic identity. So that the identity which emerges is mainly a Hindu uh, identity. So the interests of the big capital and the interest of Hindu nationalism combined, they reinforce each other because they both see one, one big market without any barriers of state, without any barriers of uh, state laws, um, without any linguistic uh, uh, emergence. That's why Hindi being promoted that you know, Hindi can become a link language and of course accompanied by English because there is a position in Tamil Nadu for the imposition of uh, uh, Hindi. So that's why these, these laws uh, are, are, it has a political, ideological agenda of Hindu nationalism, which is supported by big agribusiness uh, uh, capitalism. Yeah, uh, excuse me, uh, one more moment. If you highlight this one, actually, Hindu nationalism coming into this uh, um, struggle, was it uh, uh, obviously a split uh, between Hindu nationalist uh, factor and the uh, normal farmers into two factors? Uh, if you uh, if you get this one as highlight uh, point for the uh, whole uh, struggle, um, well, I mean um, the the Hindu nationalism obviously uh, was was also trying to appeal to the farmers 
who who in a hindu majority country a majority of the farmers are hindus but what is happening now is that the farmers are uniting together on questions on economic issues on issues of their existence of the civilization so the majority of the farmers from up uttarakhand uh, haryana rajasthan are hindus and similarly in maharashtra or in bengal so that is a challenge to hindu nation that the farmers many of them come from the jat caste but not all of them there are different castes who do farming they are coming together they are they are openly challenging and and you know news is coming that many of those farmers are saying we voted uh, bjp in, in the past for example up is very very interesting where the jat caste in western up is very dominant economically and politically bjp was able to create a rift between the jats and the muslims and there was riots against the muslim in mujaffarabad and and by winning by using the ideology of hindu nationalism creating hatred against the muslims but this new farmers movement is bringing a unity back between the jats and the muslims and the jat activists are finding how we were misled to you know many of those muslims are also farmers so our our uh, closeness to each other because of farming is stronger than our so called religious division between hindus and the muslims and similarly between the hindus and the sikhs you know majority of the farmers in punjab are sikhs majority of the farmers in haryana are hindus and in the past these divisions have been used and that is just evaporating and and farmers are consolidating behind the idea that we are farmers first and that is more important and that undermines the the ideology of hindu nationalism that you can use that to to break that solidarity yeah thanks ranjan all right thank you very much sir any other questions well there is a question sent uh, through chat uh, yeah. swadev singh sohel uh, i'll read it out no i can read what it you think i can read it yeah i can read, can read. it yeah yeah you can It's answer that question think. until somebody else uh, is thinking yeah. of okay yeah uh don't you think second agriculture act on the contract farm would be a new form of reducing farmers into indentured labor there's a fear that old british east india company experience of indigo farming is coming back under these agriculture laws and second is in case quality of land gets degraded under contractual ag agreement of these agriculture acts and farmers find land okay those who he has already act. responded to it no 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 i haven't I haven't responded no uh, rohini has already responded to it i can't see it rohini's response Uh, on the chat right anyway you can answer that question first yeah yeah i mean uh, uh, this idea of east india company is a good metaphor to use in order to show that uh, how east india company came as a trading company and 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 uh, but this is even more pernicious because east india company you could say was a foreign company okay and you could use the idea of nationalism against that and these are local companies you know and 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 the, it it is not a foreign occupation these are domestic uh, industrial houses who are going to combine it is even more pernicious uh, than 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 what happened during the east india occupation of uh, 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 agriculture on the question of quality of land being degraded now what the contract farming you know law says is that if some uh, structure is created by a a uh, uh, agro business entity in order to complete that contract farming after the contract is completed it is under obligation to remove that structure and 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 uh, restore the land to the same before the contract was reached okay and uh, this is not to do with the environmental degradation this is to do with that you might construct a little you know hot house or storage house or little little building there and that building will have to be uh, uh, taken off and and the land must be restored back to where it was before that so it, it does not really cover the environmental degradation which will uh, uh, take place yeah thanks who is next Uh, may I ask a question? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. 
now uh, as a result of the green revolution many commentators have observed there is a kind of differentiation of peasantry yeah. and the peasantry in punjab and haryana are quite rich peasants not the small or medium kind of peasant so my question is who is leading this struggle is it the, or you can see the class differences within the movement or it's a kind of a general peasant movement still you can't see any class differences or differentiations no there is obviously a differentiation of the peasantry uh, but uh, sorry sorry and and uh, <clears throat> um um yeah differentiation of the peasantry did take place but the idea of rich capitalist farming uh, is overplayed because when you say rich capitalist farmer you have images of huge amount of wealth being generated by rich capitalist farmers they are a microscopic minority 0.5 7% of the peasantry in india all over okay and i said that all over india 86.21% of the farmers are marginal and small farmers in punjab and haryana they are about 67 68% so even in punjab and haryana two third of the peasants are small and marginal farmers some of them are small middle farmers okay so 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 the rich capitalist peasantry is not leading this struggle secondly no rich capital there are small number of rich capitalist farmers obviously they are no longer going to bear the hardships which are taking place in in, in at the occupation site where you have to sleep in trolleys where in a winter cloth they live in their own houses and they they don't want to come you know uh, discomfort themselves by putting themselves in such uh, harsh weather conditions uh, as as the farmers are doing majority of the farmers are small and middle farmers there is hardly any rich capitalist farmers the rich capitalist farmers do have important role in the political parties in 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 akali dal which is a sikh political party in congress which is also controlled mainly by the sikhs um so it claims to be secular party aam aadmi party you know you know and 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 uh, or in in haryana in, uh, you know the um, international the the jan jan uh, there is a party which is linked with devi lal's tradition who was a farmer mm-hmm. there are certain section of the uh, 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 rich farmers who control this they have been pushed out by the farmers organization they are not allowed to come and speak there deliberately because they don't want any of these political parties to appropriate the struggle for their own political ends they can come and sit in the audience but they're not allowed that is the strength of this farmers or protest that they have kept the leadership under their control they 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 use their own slogan they use their own resources and it is a collective effort which is more important rather than that they are rich and and able to uh, afford afford the the things and they are they are they are they are dependent upon their religious tradition their cultural traditions the rich traditions of sikhism of providing langar is proving very very useful that's why we need to restart thinking about religion and 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 uh, uh, as 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 a potent force and and many of the ideas of left on religion are absolutely you know uh, hackneyed and and formula type uh, thinking on 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 religion that new new opportunities are being created a positive positive liberationist liberation theology uh, uh, aspect of religions coming into play where equality and and equal sharing of care and solidarity is is, is emerging so it is those traditions which are being reused and and the practices which they have the institution which they have developed for example the gurdwaras as an institution okay where uh, food is cooked collectively every day so it's not something new for them they have been doing that for for, for centuries so they have brought those traditions back into the struggle and and that has been the source of struggle and they have one large number of new supporters for example this langar which are run people from the surrounding areas poor people they come and eat there because anyone can come and eat there so they are building new kind of solidarities and ties as as a, as a result of that so this is this is uh, bjp propaganda that this is led by rich capitalist farmers and and uh, they are the ones who are leading the struggle and and some of the marxists have also fallen victim to this when stray stray agents though the mainstream left parties are not and 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 uh, 
they understand that this is really a struggle of small and marginal farmers and some middle farmers and rich capitalists uh, are, have been totally kept out. So th this, this is the propaganda and, and unfortunately bought by some stray isolated sects among the Marxists who think that it's a rich capitalist farming. That's totally wrong. Thank you. Who's next? Kalpa? Uh, there's another question on chat. Maybe uh, Pritam can. Uh, uh, is this the, I have heard that in rural India, farmers are increasingly getting organized as smaller farmer gone to stand on their feet. What is your idea and how much the trend has been mentioned? I think that has been covered mm. that uh, uh, small farmers are organizing themselves. And I would say that there are some small farming organizations which are going beyond this. They are going beyond these uh, demands that they are organizing cooperative farming. For example, there is a Jameen Prapti Sangar Samiti in, in Punjab. It's a small organization. It's an organization of Dalit uh, 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 farmers who are landless farmers who, who are able to have small pieces of land which they are legally entitled to because there is a, there is a shamlet land in every village, which is a common land. And the, and the law provides that 33% of that common land must be given to Dalit farmers. In the past, that has been usurped by upper caste farmers. But now these, these farmers' organizations have given support to these Dalit organizations. And in some places, they have been able to win certain share of that common land. And they have, collect, they have cultivated that land collectively. And they, 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 they mm -hmm. are able to generate enough food for them. They, they, do, they do need to work outside that uh, collective uh, uh, cooperative farm, but cooperative farm has, have generated new kinds of solidarities between them and new ways of practicing that. It doesn't have to be an individual private property on which you have to cultivate. You can, you can do it on, on, on a collective basis. So there are organizations like that. And similarly, there are organizations in other places where, which are also going towards organic farming that we need to have, uh, uh, you know, produce, which is free from fertilizer and insecticides, because farmers in Punjab at least, and I think to a great extent in Haryana, have realized that the food which they are producing is a poisonous food, you know? That's why there have been incidents of disease, massive disease. Punjab has enormous amount of cancer deaths because excessive fertilizer and insecticides. So farmers are becoming aware of this, that this agriculture which they have practiced, which has brought some degree of prosperity to farming community, is actually causing their health and leading to deaths and, and leading to indebtedness because this is also encouraging consumerism. And so they, they, these small farmers organizations, isolated attempts are dethrowing these ideas which fit in with what I call eco-socialist path of transition. That you have to build an alternative lifestyle, you know, which is not based on excessive consumption and excessive display of wealth, but living together, simple food, organic food, natural food, and, and lower level of consumption, you know, you don't have to multiply your uh, wants. And these organizations are, are developing, yes, in different parts. They're isolated, but I think they will grow. And this farmers movement is giving, giving encouragement to such acts also. And once we're able to develop these ideas of alternative uh, ways of organizing agriculture, they will have the theoretical background to, 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 to support their uh, ways of doing things. Uh, I mean, I want to ask you one question. In Sri Lanka, how is this uh, protest movement being seen? Alice? How this protest movement in, 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 in India, how it is being seen? Is it getting coverage in the press? Or have there been any solidarity marches uh, with the farmers' organizations? Yeah. By working class organization or left wing organizations? Well, organization it happened in two ways. It happened in two ways. Hmm. One is the workers' strike or the workers' trade union action in Sri Lanka, Colombo Fort. Hmm. Colombo Fort. Uh, because there was a move by the Sri Lankan government to sell part of the 
part of the container terminal to Adani Group. So therefore, most of the uh, workers, trade unions, when they fight for the uh, jetty or the container church terminal, they raise the issue of Adani and the character of Adani. So that's the one way of connecting it. And the other thing is there are so many peasant struggle going on in Sri Lanka at the moment. Mm. And they are related to some extent with the environmental issues. Mm. For example, in Hambantota, which is uh, about 200 kilometers from Colombo, mm. uh, which is the uh, area dominated by Rajapaksa family, there is, uh, I think, more than 50 days now, and a struggle going on. And their demand is make a sanctuary for elephants. Otherwise, mm. they will come to our land and ah. ruin our land. So okay. kind of mixing uh -huh. environment with the production and the security of production, I think that struggle is going on there. Uh -huh. uh, and in addition to that, there are so many uh, seminars, so many meetings supporting uh, and uh, expressing their solidarity with the farmers movement in India. So I think for the first time or for the first time in recent years, even some people try to connect the revolutionary movement in India with the revolutionary movement in Sri Lanka and, you know, South Asian region. So these are the kind of uh, things that I can see uh, I can observe, uh, especially in relation to the farmers' struggle in uh, India. Well, maybe you should write an article on that. <laughs> you know, yeah. next article and, and on. there is another issue, hmm. which I think uh, uh, related to your last part of your presentation, hmm. the ecological aspect. Hmm. And there is a very strong discussion going on. Even we have two, three webinars here mm -hmm. on Marx School. Mm. about the ecological mm. farming mm. Uh, and the small scale production. Mm. Uh, now, for example, zero cost or zero budget farming, mm. which is very much practiced in Andhra Pradesh in India. Mm. And it's kind of, we have a movement which try to popularize it in Sri Lanka as well. Mm. I think, uh, because of the use of this fertilizer, pesticides, and other elements of industrial agriculture, the mm. cost of production has gone up. And mm. as a result, the peasant surplus became very, very small. I think mm. probably this may have affected even Haryana and Punjab uh, farmers. Uh, because of the increase in cost of production, their, sur their, their surplus or their margin, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, they have been reduced, and that may also a reason, maybe a reason for them to come out of. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I yeah, think, all, yeah, yeah. So I think the. I mean, yeah. Can the you, indebtedness is obviously because of that that the revenue of the farmers surplus revenue has been you know depleting, and 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 in fact they uh, you know incurring losses in order mm -hmm. to cover their. You know, daily consumption needs they are having to borrow, and 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 that is leading them to indebtedness, and that is the fear of the farmers that their indebtedness will eventually lead to distress of land, you know, distress land sale, and that's how the big guard. Uh, you mentioned about Adani, so Adani is present in Sri Lanka as well, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Mm. That's interesting. Which which kind of uh, 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 agricultural markets is he is he, is he in? Uh, which kind of products which he's kind of going into? You mean Adani? Uh -huh. No, Adani in is Lanka. not involved in agricultural production in Sri Lanka. Uh -huh. But they are in for the transport, this uh, international uh, port container terminal. Okay, okay, okay. But people relate it with the Indian struggle because saying that there is a struggle against Adan in India. Why mm. not we struggle against him? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. That happened in Australia because he has coal mines yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, sorry, one more question I would like to ask. Um, three terms. Um, mm. 
as you mentioned, according to your explanation, uh, government of India tried to impose three laws into the farmers. Mm. Mm. Um, which uh, you explained third one as um, it is um, a fact uh, that um, the the buyers of um, the buyers can store their uh, production and wait until the price gone up and then they can sell them back for the very mm. huge profit. Mm. Uh, that's what actually happened in Sri Lanka too in um, uh, rice mills and they the 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 buyers of uh, very uh, rich people, they buy um, the product for farmers in the um, harvest season and then they're stored into their storage mm. and wait until they um, make the scarcity of the food and they later they sell a uh, very big, uh, keep a very big profit. Uh, mm. That's one game they are playing with the farmers mm. actually. Mm. Mm. Um, uh, in this, uh, case actually uh, how uh, like uh, communist uh, party dominant Kerala and such, such states how they uh, deal with these sort of things uh, because they are governing uh, some regions as communist parties so how how do they uh, uh, react for these sort of uh, uh, cases well in, in in i mean the communists are in power in in Sri Lanka, uh, in kerala at the moment um, they were in power in Bengal and Tripura for a long time, but they were voted out in the last election. Um, the Kerala government, along with other governments, are challenging these uh, laws in India Supreme Court. Uh, at least they have announced, I'm not 100% sure where, where that stands. Punjab, Chhattisgarh, and Kerala have passed domestic laws, you know, in, uh, and Rajasthan. They have passed state laws in their own assembly against these laws. Now, the, the legal validity of those laws may not be very substantial, but it is an indicator that we are asserting our regional autonomy. Um, Kerala um, communist government is certainly trying to help small farmers organization um, or uh, other small economic entities and rural areas, including fisheries, et cetera, because that's quite important in, in, in Kerala. And, and uh, it is certainly not uh, in tune with this uh, 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 Hindu nationalist agenda and trying to reduce this kind of communal communalization of that uh, process. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, they, 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 they have been so far doing them reasonably well. There are criticism of other kinds of bureaucratization et cetera in, in the CPM, um, but which is a different story. But uh, I think that they have been generally on the side of workers and peasants and small farmers against the big metropolitan, big international capital and big national capital. Thank you very much. Hey. Uh, can I ask a question, uh, Professor Preeti? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, great presentation. And uh, maybe you slightly touched upon this point, but I wanted to ask uh, like sort of, sort of paradigm change that you proposed during the presentation like the eco-socialist prospects of the, of the agriculture. Does this demand, I mean, does these prospects or the demand like incorporated into the recent protest? Do they have a sort of idea? And is there a sort of intellectual development sort of study going on about the prospects of the eco-socialist tendencies in India? Uh, well, as far as uh, looking at the conversation which are taking place at the farmers' protests, this is not coming up. Uh, 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 what is coming up there is that these laws will lead to an attack on a civilization, mm -hmm. that, that our, our way of life will be affected, that you know, we live in a countryside, we have a collective community, those communities will be disintegrated, we will be atomized and, and, and converted into you know, sort of atomized workers without our traditions of village solidarity and village collective life, mm -hmm. etc. That, those are coming up. But people like me, there are not many, but there are some who are trying to you know, put this idea into their minds through newspaper articles, through various other uh, mechanisms, that we have to start rethinking, reimagining a, a new kind of agriculture. That, that even if we succeed, that doesn't mean that we, we go back to the old agriculture, which is also environmentally destructive, which, is, which is leads to inequality, which leads to you know, damages to health of, of 
of human beings, of animals, of 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 land, and 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 uh, you know deforestation and and in water pollution and and air pollution. We don't have to go back to that. We have to st re start rethinking. And as I ended in the you know that the the one thing one can certainly say that if these laws succeed and the the movement fails, certainly there will be massive environmental destruction. So a necessary condition for a social eco socialist path is that this government move must fail, farmers must prefer. But in order to move towards the eco-socialist path, that is not a sufficient condition. Sufficient condition would be the introduction of these ideas, the introduction of these debates, that we need to have a new agriculture. Now, it is, it is, uh, it is coming up that, that farmers' organizations are becoming aware because there is small attempts at organic farming uh, in Punjab also taking place. Some of them are religious in nature, others are you know, not religious. Uh, for example, the Golden Temple in, in Amritsar, which is a holy Sikh shrine, they are emphasizing of organic food being produced, that the, the, the food which they cook, uh, that should come from organic sources. So there is, there is, there is kind of valuing of that uh, tradition, which is, which is coming up through the, through the struggle. And I hope, and, and, and I actually believe that that will succeed, that farmers rely that we don't just go back to the old practice. But first, we have to begin this battle, you know. And and what uh, uh, the attempt, people like me, is that while they're involved in this, this idea should be pushed. They should start thinking and debating uh, these issues. Well, you said that agriculture is a state subject under Indian constitution. Yeah. So yeah. can the central government pass laws affecting yeah. the constitutional state subject uh, or non-constitutional state subject, or is it in a concurrent list? Yeah, I, I, that's a very good question, you know, factually. What has happened is that the concurrent list is one list where the subjects which are mentioned in the concurrent list, both the center and the state can pass laws. And if a conflict arises, the overriding clause is the center's rule will prevail. Mm -hmm. Now, the central government uh, is saying that what we are saying is, is based on one item in the concurrent list called trading. That trading in agriculture products is in the concurrent list. That these laws have been passed under that act. So it's not unconstitutional. The farmers organization are saying that it's not only trading. You are directly <laughs> impinging on production. That that you might be saying that we are setting up alternative trading uh, uh, yards, which are which are beyond the state regulated uh, markets. And, and you're using this concurrent clause in that, but that trading is directly linked into production that's impacting on production and production is not in the, in, in the central list. So they, they, they are questioning the constitutional validity of that. It is a gray area, certainly. And, 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 uh, the Supreme Court can intervene on this uh, uh, if, if, if it wants to. And uh, this issue has not been debated in the Supreme Court. Supreme Court uh, has not. There are some groups which have taken this case to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court has not. They said, we are not looking at the constitutional status. We are just saying that, you know, we'll hold this. That's what they have proposed at the moment. But I think that at some stage, the constitutional status will, will, will come up. And, and um, that issue will again raise more issues of, of federal division of powers between the center and the state. But it has kind of remained in the background. But the farmers' organization and some of the leaders in the farmers' organization, for example, Rajewal is, is one leader in, from Punjab who's very well acquainted with this. He has been in the farmers' mm -hmm. organization for almost 50 years. And, 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 and uh, he has questioned the government in the negotiation which are taking place again and again, that this is the state subject. And then the government mm -hmm. tells them that if, if you think that we have intruded into your uh, area, then go to the Supreme Court. But the farmers have themselves not gone to the Supreme Court, partly because they do not have trust in the Supreme Court. Because Supreme Court has been so weakened by central intervention that they think that the Supreme Court will say it's constitutional, and then we will not be able to, uh, then if we have to pose, then we'll have to pose again, again, again in the Supreme Court. So we, we will not go. But there are groups and individuals outside the farmers' organization 
who have put a petition to the to the Supreme Court, and there is something called sub auto recognition. That Supreme Court, if it wants, it can take an issue even if no one puts a petition. Okay, no one go contacts. It can do that, but Supreme Court is not doing that because various other enactments by the Supreme Court has been very much pro government and 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 weakening of its autonomy. So therefore, this constitutional issue um, will be debated more in people's court rather than in the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Is it mandatory for the state to implement? This kind of laws, if they, the, these laws are passed, yes, yes. If the because there is a clear, uh, uh, I mean, I have the actual words with me, but I have a feeling that if I start reading, my, my, I won't, you won't be, you, you won't be able to hear me because of my past practices. That if you start reading somehow or the other, the voice doesn't come. Mm. There are there are clear passages that state government will not have the right to question any of these things. This is mentioned in the uh, one of the laws. The, the second one that on the contract farming that all, once this law is passed states do not have any any right to question that they will have to implement what the central authority i'm asking this question because our constitution was changed in 1983 mm. passing the 13th amendment mm. which was in fact drafted in india mm. Now, in that constitution, if a provincial provincial government, so that is equal to state government, mm. does not pass that that regulations before the central government passed it, mm. then that that particular province, there's no mandatory thing that particular province should implement that particular law. So I think mm. even in India, there may be that kind of close because our our constitutional changes very closely follow the Indian constitutional situation. No, I mean trade, trading is uh, trading in agricultural products is is uh, a concurrent list. State can pass laws, and that's one reason they have passed the laws. Yeah. But if it the 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 as I said, the overriding clause is if there is a conflict between a law passed by the center and the law passed by the state under the concurrent, then the overriding clause is centers will prevail. So so. Mm -hmm. Eventually, in practice, anything which is in the concurrent list goes in the favor of center. It is it is almost like a subject which is in the central list. Mm -hmm. Okay, others about the situation in India. Uh, Professor Pritham, I, uh, I want to I want to raise a sort of follow-up question uh, mm. because I'm very optimistic about the idea of eco socialist eco socialist uh, sort of take sort of approach to agriculture. Excellent. I mean, what is I mean, what what is your observations about the way possible ways that these big capital houses could actually confront these kind of models, these kind of ideas, and at the same time, what what would what should be the role of the academia science education, especially in India, uh, what are the observations that you should, that you could actually make? Um, I, I think that uh, that's a very good question because uh, some of the international organizations or um, multinationals are also preaching uh, green agenda. Just the other day, Shell came with a uh, position that by 2050, it will have zero emissions. And Shell is an oil company, and oil is one of the major contributors to carbon emissions. So it, it looked like a very contradictory, but part of the reason is that they are going into non-oil forms of energy. They are, they are trying to move into more renewable forms of energy. Now, it is possible that capitalist organizations might also start doing this, especially large capitalist organizations who have a long-term view, okay? that if, if the earth is destroyed, there will be nothing to uh, you know, exploit. So you know, from the viewpoint of sustainable, sustainable profit objective, we should keep this earth you know, alive and, and we should follow certain practices. But they might introduce uh, some of the green uh, uh, issues uh, in that. Um, but there is, there is one problem. 
uh, two problems. One, that even Shell, for example, though it is said that it will have zero emissions, but it is not suspending its oil business. It is actually expanding its oil business. So part of this is what is called greenwashing. Part of this is genuine understanding of their business that you know they 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 they, they will they will benefit from this if if they move towards more green uh, kind of business. The other important thing is that the study scientific studies suggest that small scale farming, where family labor participates in production, and it is carried on with more care to the uh, natural fauna and flora emits less carbon dioxide emissions compared with large scale farming which is mechanized which which you know leads to deforestation clearing of trees clearing of forests and actually emits you know carbon dioxide emission so eco socialist uh, framework will have to reemphasize the importance of small scale farming or cooperative farming which is based on clubbing together small scale farming rather than large scale capitalist farming so it is it is a kind of major challenge to to the existing ways of uh, capital development yeah ridley yeah i've got uh, can you hear me yeah yeah Hello? yeah we can hear you but little yeah, my louder. Question, my, yeah, my uh, question in regard to the uh, the Marxist sort of uh, the formulation of capitalist industrial development, where Marx sort of identifies the Western uh, capitalist development. Uh, where really little louder. Yeah, in Marx's critique of capital, where he sort of based his critique on the basis of the Western capitalist development as, as a paradigm, industrial capitalist development, which, um, and then the, 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 the socialist, the Marxist after Marx, uh, from second international, the third international, even the Soviet model was developed on the basis of, you know, going through the capitalist, the Western industrial capitalist development, which leads, you know, sort of, uh, 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 leading to, to socialist development. I think so we can't that, hear it, Lee. No. Some you problem with your signals, I think. Uh, if you, you could speak now? loudly, I think it will be all right. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. that's better. Yeah. Right. That's Maybe fine. you should speak near the uh, uh, screen. Yeah. Right. Close to the mic, yeah. Okay. Now, my my question my question is regarding the uh, in terms of the the the, the Marxist critique of the Western uh, capitalist development uh, in the European countries, which later on, you know, uh, was uh, developed as a model of development even under socialism uh, within the, the the Soviet Union, the Communist Party was the, the rapid industrialization and collectivization of agriculture was very much based on the Western capitalist industrial development. So from what I can from what I can gather from, from your, your, your your presentation, so this is the, the centralization of uh, agricultural production, even under socialism, should we not be questioning this paradigm of, of centralization, central planning, uh, especially within the agricultural, the food production? You say even within the socialist model that uh, we need to make a shift of uh, 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 developing yeah, paradigm. Yeah. In a, a, yeah. A, a, Very good a question. question. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, two things I have to say. One that the uh, collectivization model, which was practiced in China, or oh, sorry, in Russia, and more or less practiced in other countries where one could say that some kind of socialism was being attempted, even in China. China is a major industrialized country now. Uh, the idea was the same in terms of development, that development means industrialization that industrialization allows you to bring in new techniques, which leads to rise in productivity, 
and rise in productivity has to take place to create abundance. And it's only in abundance that uh, you know the working week can be reduced, leisure can be increased, and cultural development will take place, and so on and so forth. So, so, so there was there was a belief in the usefulness of large scale production, which leads to economies of scale, which leads to rise in productivity and rise in material development, and 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 that material development creating the conditions of cultural uh, development. So one. You know, on one one uh, aspect of that socialist view of of development was a copy in a different form of the Western capitalist model of development of of uh, industrialization and, and and looking at development through the industrialization uh, process. Except for the difference that it will not be private property; it will be collective property. That's why collectivization. So so the benefits of collective benefits of large scale production. Of, of economies of scale of increase in productivity are not 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 reaped by small number of capitalists as it happens in the capitalist countries, but it is shared by the whole society. So that that is one one kind of uh, uh, dimension which 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 uh, uh, the the socialist models of uh, development uh, took place. Now, what was missing in that was the ecological dimension, be partly because the knowledge wasn't available. I mean, it's 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 it is now uh, in Marx's writing. There is an understanding in Marx's Capital and Grundrisse. Marx refers again and again to 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 the you know degradation of soil and and to capital and and uh, you know rupture between nature and and capital and and he refers. But this is not fully developed. It is not central to his work. Okay, there are there are sites and 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 other people who have developed you know work. They they go back to Marx and say that Marx Marx was also a pro eco socialist and he there is enough material. I think that's overplay. It is certainly true that Marx was aware of this, but he did not develop a central uh, thesis out of this that how ecology has to be protected, that how protection of ecology is central to the social project. That does not emerge from that development. That is the task of later Marxists and 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 that where we stand, you know, of eco socialism. So, so um, um, it is absolutely right that um, one one criticism of that uh, uh, um, old socialist model, which was most extreme form of Stalinist uh, collectivization, is belief in large scale production, belief in the economies of scale emerging from large scale production, and increase in productivity, increase in productivity leading to material abundance. So that's one. Second is this idea. That good life necessarily demands material abundance, which which also needs to be questioned. That that this idea that happiness eventually lies in material abundance. This is partly because Marx and Engels were also dealing with a period of shortages and scarcity, and therefore this idea that new technology leads to increase in productivity will overcome these natural barriers, and 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 uh, even some cases. Uh, Engels going as far as saying that control of nature, you know, not living with nature, control of nature, because nature uh, is is uh, creating a hindrance in its further exploitation uh, for material progress. That has to be questioned in eco socialist uh, framework. That we we that idea the Marx said that everyone, you know, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. So you know. Uh, needs can be material needs that everyone will have whatever need can be fulfilled. We have to relook at those needs. Okay, that you know needs uh, does not necessarily mean material needs. Need needs mean cultural needs. You know spiritual needs. You know that you know human happiness does not lie in acquisition of more and more goods. That is a capitalist logic. So that's another kind of criticism one has to make of that large scale production. Uh, uh, which was justified under uh, socialism, uh, that it in, in a way it copies the, the 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 capitalist logic of of good life. So one is the uh, kind of economic dimension, other the kind of uh, social and 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 uh, conception of life dimension of 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 uh, material production leading to happiness and good life. Right. We have another six minutes. Is any yeah. other questions? 
if there are no question, I'll ask one final question. Yeah. That is now this farmer struggle in India. Yeah. I think it started about three, four months back. It started in June. Uh, it started in June 2020, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it has become a very prolonged struggle. Yes. I think probably in Indian history, we can't see this kind of prolonged struggle by peasants. I don't know, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Now the question has two parts. One is what is the response of the other working people towards the struggle? Uh, will there be a, some kind of solidarity campaign and the solidarity action by the uh, proletariat, by the working people in other uh, sectors in the economy? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. Second, as this is a prolonged struggle, prolonged struggle, it's very difficult to sustain this kind of struggle. Mm. Uh, so what do you expect or what would be the future of this struggle as you sort of uh, observe it? That's yeah, the second yeah. part of the question. Yeah. Thanks. The, on, on the first part, there was one Bharat Band, I think it was in September, which was a great success. But certainly more needs to be done, especially by left-wing organizations that industrial workers, workers in financial industries and banking, insurance and other sectors, how they need to be organized and mobilized. Because BJP will try to also, they haven't come out openly, but here and there they mention that this is, an, this is a struggle by farmers to get good prices of their food, which means that the food will be more costly, urban consumers will, and it will be adversely affected. Though, of course, farmers' organization have to give a counter-argument, as I suggested, that the, the big uh, stockpiling of food will lead to speculative trading, and that is likely to be rise in prices, rather than farmers asking for better prices for the product. So, so the, I think the left does need to do more work on mobilizing other sections of the population in support of solidarity actions, in support of the uh, 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 farmers. The second about the sustainability. Um, the um, sustainability has two angles. One is that if the, if the struggle remains like this, that the government does not uh, initiate repression, the farmers are quite capable of staying for months or even years, partly because they've already built up the institutions. They have built up the institutions of providing food. Okay? They have also been taking care of even medicines, and, and you know, sleeping at night. And, and so they have been able to build up an alternative uh, structure of continuation of daily life, okay, which goes on. And they are developing a kind of rotation system of work that um, from a family, one person comes at the protest, stays for a month or month and a half, then goes back, another member of the family comes. So they are developing this rotation system and they, they are actually going beyond this. They might even go beyond this. That village community will do that. That maybe if even if all the family members of one family go away, other farming families will take care of their agriculture. So they are developing a strategy of long-term sustainability of this struggle. And that is where the strength of this struggle lies. That the in, in many trade union struggles, that is one problem that once the monthly income stops coming, workers become so impoverished that they eventually are forced into submission because of hunger and starvation. This moment will be able to sustain that, that is there. But if the government chooses a path of repression, how the government will, how the moment will respond to that is, 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 is a serious question. The um, government is uh, so far using a double-edged uh, strategy. On one hand, saying that we respect the farmers, you know, you know, so on and so forth, but also using limited repressive apparatus, for example, arresting uh, active uh, militant sections, arresting, you know, journalists who are, you know, reporting on this, and, and but not launching a direct attack on the farming leadership and arresting them. They might do that. The only fear which, the, which prevents the state from, you know, going wholehearted repression on, on the farmers' movement is, they feel that it might spread. And if they spread, 
then by the time the next election comes, BJP will be defeated in the election. And they can already see that many farmers have come out openly saying, last time we voted the BJP, we are not going to be that. And, and uh, so that is a check against the possibility of repression. Uh, that, that the fear of, of uh, defeating BJP in elections and, and, and the parliamentary election is going to come in 2024. But before that, there will be state elections. And if in state elections, BJP start getting defeated, then they will get the signal that eventually they'll be defeated. And they might have to annoy their agro-capitalist corporations whose interests are being protected that, you know, if we lose power, then you will also lose power. So you better reach some kind of, some kind of compromise. OK. Any, if there's no questions, I can wind up the session. Right. Uh, Professor Pritham, thank you very much for making a very nice, very good presentation uh, on farmer struggle in India. And uh, it will help to build even the Sri Lankan peasant movement on many issues. And we have also been discussing about this eco-socialist paradigm shift that is, that is very much necessary if you really want to build a socialist kind of society. Because it is not only the class relationship, but also the relationship with the ecology or the social metabolism that is very much important in changing new structures and developing new structures. Uh, so on behalf of the Marx School, I thank once again uh, for making this presentation and you send your article PDF version, then I will uh, try to sort of translate it into Sinhala and Tamil uh, and to circulate widely. Okay. So with that note, I will conclude this session and thank you very much for everyone who participated in the discussion. Thank you once again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Peter. It was very enlightening. Oh, thank you. I'm glad. I'm very happy to know about your support to eco-socialist vision. <laughs> of course, of course. We can meet once again to talk about probably this eco-socialist paradigm shift or something like that. Because we are also, we have this started a discussion on that theme. Yeah. And Kalpa, right. what do you do? I'm doing my PhD at the new school, Professor. Okay. Yeah. In Colombo? Sorry? In Colombo? Uh, at the new school, New York. New school for social. Oh, new school social. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. All right, very nice. Who's your supervisor? They are using that resources to mark school. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm working with uh, Professor Anwar and Professor Clara from Italy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Anwar, you know Anwar, Anwar Shai. Friend of mine. Say my hello to him. Of course, I will. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, right. Thank you very much once again. Okay. All the best. Yeah. See you later.